So, with no further ado, passing it off to our noon talk, uh, I'm kind of excited here. We have the, the, an the Animaniacs with us from Steven Spielberg's, you know, famous uh, cartoon show that ended here in 1998. Um, and after that, uh, these uh, individuals uh, went into the wonderful world of InfoSec. So, um, they're going to uh, really give us some in cool information here on hacking the stars, hacking space, kind of looking out, uh, thinking about hacking in different places. So, please put your hands together to welcome Yakko, Wacko, and Dot to the stage. Thank you. It was a really solid intro. We could just uh, take that applause and call it a day. Um, so, this talk before I start rolling through it uh, grew out of us uh, observing this, you know, hack the planet energy in the InfoSec community that uh, has targeted all the things on planet Earth. Uh, you know, most of you guys take that out of here back to your enterprise or back to your hackerspace or back to your um, pen testing uh, work that you do. Uh, and a lot of that is still happening on the ground. Meanwhile, uh, there are bits flying back and forth from here to space and uh, all day, every day, all over the world, uh, terabits of data now um, that needs protecting and examining. Uh, so we're going to open that story. Um, for the folks in the room, I want to make sure you're in the right talk today. Uh, if you, you have IT, um, I could use some, some hands just to get a sense of the room. Who's, who's got a remote site with a VSAT? Uh, or, you know, offices that have, like, payment processors that use a satellite link back to Visa? Um, anybody oil and gas? Uh, remote sites with little Global Star Iridium links talking back to home. All right. Sure. Who's building satellites? There you go. <laughs> or uh, university programs launching CubeSats. Uh, all right, cool. We got. Is there anyone in the room that would not answer that question if they had satellites? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, Very good. Uh, so who are we? Uh, we already got the solid intro, but um, you know, we're folks that have been doing pen testing, security engineering in the RF space for a while. Um, we've been competing in the wireless CTF the last few years uh, here in a, at DEF CON. Uh, it's been a, a great way to kind of push the edge of what open source tools are out there and uh, things available to the community to go after. RF, which is like critical to space, it's really hard to run a wire there. Um, some ground rules for this talk. Uh, this is a place where you can go down a rabbit hole. There are so many elements to the things that we're going to run through today that uh, we just can't really do justice to any of them. So I will happily take abuse if it means uh, we get more content later from folks on these topics. Um, we're going to keep it as approachable as possible. Uh, I'm going to point out a bunch of projects in the community that are doing good things in space that folks should look at. Um, we're going to talk about how accessible space is to everyone in the room, uh, especially all the folks that have not been exposed to it before. Uh, and we're going to empower all the skiddies out there with some dangerous knowledge in the hopes that that's going to push uh, the security side of this forward a little more. Um, and breaking down the sections of what we're presenting, uh, Two quick level sets, one with some brief history to give you a sense of scale and time. Uh, then we'll talk about components, uh, parts of the process. I'm going to scare the crap out of you guys with how easy it is to disrupt a lot of this stuff. Uh, present some shopping ideas, because there's a lot of places to waste your money. Uh, and then just a little bit about like how to get started with your own tooling. Uh, so uh, some, some quick other work. Uh, that needs to be highlighted before I start, because if you've seen either of these talks, they, they are deep dives. Um, very good presentations, uh, especially that one from DEF CON 23. He runs through uh, an entire reverse engineering of one of the Global Star protocols. Um, definitely uh, a great way to learn about all the different components at a, a pretty deep level uh, in that RF uh, space. All right. So the level set for everybody in the room. Uh, where did SATCOM come from? Uh, or how has it evolved? Uh, three early programs that set the stage for today. Um, 
score was a cassette tape player that went up into space in uh, 58, broadcasting a shortwave message. Uh, people around the world could listen to it. That was the, the marked as the first SATCOM uh, in the sky. Uh, Echo 1 was a balloon, big inflatable reflector for microwave. Now we were talking about bouncing signals uh, from the earth back down to the ground. Uh, and then when Telstar 1 went up, 1962, I think that's 58 years ago. Did I do my math right? Can I add? Yeah. Uh, 58 years ago, uh, that was the first transponder to go on orbit. Uh, the, the spoiler for the rest of this talk is that the, the technology has evolved a lot, but the, the model hasn't really changed. Uh, it's starting to change, but it hasn't really changed. Uh, which is one of the reasons the, the state of the art on the security side, I think, has been stagnant. Uh, today, uh, just highlighting a you know, field of folks for you to look up that are big players in the, the innovative space. Um, you know, there's tons of commercial groups that are using the space segment uh, for non-government, non-military, uh, non-weather related purposes. Uh, highlight Hawkeye 360 on here that, uh, you know, look them up, they are providing RF sensing, uh, so doing, you know, Signal spying from space for hire. Uh, company uh, local-ish, or at least they have an office that's local-ish. But uh, try buy that logo often. Um, yeah, so look them up. Uh, getting into part two, what are all these bits and pieces that you need to know about for us to have this conversation? Uh, I'm going to try really hard to use the right words to not turn this into word salad of signal processing stuff. Uh, but when you go back to look at these slides and punch through everything, um, when you're dealing with RF, uh, you'll hear people use all kinds of different names that mean the same thing when they're talking about frequencies. Um, I am quick to go to the, the band designator on the, the left there, the L band, C band, X band, K U K. Uh, those just mean different frequencies of spectrum. Uh, there are hands in the room, folks that do the whole amateur radio game. Uh, you'll, where you'll hear your, your 70 centimeter, two meter, uh, you know, millimeter wave, those kinds of measurements come out of that community. All of it goes back to some kind of RF. So try to be good about not switching between different contexts as we talk. But, uh, so what's going on in our communication link? What are the different parts? It's a little bit different than having an Ethernet cable going between two hubs, switches, routers, uh, or, or fiber. Um, in our, our standard SATCOM scenario for today, we have this concept of a bent pipe. Signal comes up from somewhere, it hits space, it gets turned around and shot back down to the ground, uh, just like plumbing in the sky. What are those different pieces? Um, your, your VSAT terminal on the left is the ground element, the, the uh, fielded or the very small aperture terminal, I guess is your, your acronym, uh, that's gonna send an uplink signal to the satellite. Uh, it's gonna get turned around or transponded, shifted in frequency from usually within a band, but from any frequency to any other frequency and then shot down the downlink to a teleport. Um, awesome name, extension of like airport, seaport, spaceport, teleport, where your telecommunications land. Um, and then I, I highlight here where our, our commsat is. I, I pick on Viasat a bunch through here. I have no ill will toward them or affiliation with them, but they had uh, great renderings that uh, had transparent backgrounds. So. And there are citations for all of these images if you want to go hunt them down uh, at the end of the slides. So some places where you'll spot VSATs. Uh, look out for them. They are everywhere. Uh, I was sitting up in my hotel room this morning looking out the window just at the tops of buildings and you see all kinds of different things pointing up in the sky. A lot of it's TV and, and just direct downlink data. But uh, you know, this is obviously a remote site on a, a mountainside somewhere where we had to get the internet in and out. Um, or uh, RigNet has an interesting project where they're trying to extend uh, you know, high throughput data to oil platforms in the Arctic. Um, that requires a you know, 
special kind of satellite that's going to have view of the Arctic. Um, and then there's the, the police with their mobile command center. Uh, great big dish on the top. There's probably important bits going in and out of there or they wouldn't have put it there. Um, so when you're up in the sky looking down, right, from your transponder, um, it's not just one big omni antenna that's shooting down uh, or shooting RF out in every direction. These are super far away, right, way out in the geo belt of space. Uh, lots of very directional transponders pointing down at the Earth. So uh, for a, a link to function uh, on that bent pipe, you have to be able to, to be in the right spot beam on the right frequency, pointing at the right spot. Uh, that's right, 36,000 kilometers out. Is that, is that where we're going? It's pretty far. Uh, somebody can correct me on that. Yeah, um, so this is a, a HughesNet KU laydown. Uh, I think they've got another bird that's farther uh, uh, west that's going to cover that side here. But it's also a really old laydown, so I'm sure they've updated since then. Uh, when you get down to the ground, talking about teleports, you start to see things like this. Uh, they pop up in good RF quiet places, lots of dishes of different sizes pointing all different directions. Um, one thing that I, I love about this picture, there's a lot of really expensive bits that get delivered here. Um, the security, unless the fence is like a mile out at the edge of the, the field, um, you know, you can see a, a little, little fence off to the far right of the image, but, uh, you know, it does not look like the data centers with the barbed wire in Ashburn, um, you know, keep, keeping all the bits safe for everyone with their, their Netflix. Um, physically, this is not the most secure building uh, or, or secure uh, site. So, always shocks me. Um, so, I talked about the, the transponder laydown, just going back a couple of slides. This is from a geosynchronous satellite. Stays in the same spot wherever... Uh, Wherever the Earth spins, it's going to be pointing at the same place on Earth. Um, something that Iridium has done, uh, or, or launched with their constellation, uh, is a LEO satellite. So it's going on the same kind of orbit as the International Space Station, where the satellites are constantly orbiting the Earth. Uh, it takes a full network. Oh gosh, I'm going to get this number wrong. See the atomic number for Iridium? 73? Yeah, that's like, I think, in the 60s or so. 77? 77. So they planned on 77 satellites to complete this orbit, named it Iridium. Turns out they only needed 66, uh, so maybe they should change their name. Uh, they have, uh, <laughs> threw a few more up, they have some hot spares. They actually did that last year where uh, something uh, went wrong with the, one of their platforms and they were able to swap in one that was in a, a you know, holding orbit ready to go. Uh, what this does, it brings your, your communications infrastructure much closer. Now we're talking like 600 kilometers instead of 36,000 kilometers. Uh, much lower power uh, RF equipment to interact with these things. Uh, speaking of lower power RF equipment, uh, these are just two examples of small Iridium devices. Uh, I've worked on a number of places that had remote sensing sites. Uh, you've either got like security alarms on fences where you're trying to cover a huge amount of space uh, or trail cameras in a wildlife management scenario that are just not super accessible by point-to-point um, -point microwave or other kinds of RF transmission. Uh, you'll see these little Iridium radios on the right. Um, oh shoot, I think I brought my exemplar today. Um, that's a satellite modem that's sending burst data back and forth to that constellation in LEO. Um, a little bit later, uh, my colleague's going to talk about uh, how easy it is to get into that data. Most of that Iridium waveform uh, is just not like protected or encrypted or enciphered, and it's all just flying around in the clear. So for folks that are running critical infrastructure where they're sending monitoring data back over Iridium, 
starts to look like a really juicy target for some of the same kinds of RF attacks that are taking place in the wireless CTF right down the hall. Um, yeah, and I, I highlight that module if you want to, you know, go out and buy one. I think this is from SparkFun. Uh, you can do this way cheaper. This guy's turnkey. So throughout this talk, I just try to point out some some easy things to buy. Um, super cheap access to space. Uh, the other part of this diagram that, that we hadn't really talked about yet, uh, we focused on that payload link, on that comm link, how you get your bits from one site back to your teleport. Uh, there's also the controlling of the space segment. Somebody's got to fly the satellite. Sometimes that happens at the same teleport. Sometimes that happens at a different one. Uh, a lot of those uh, telemetry signals coming back down off the satellite or commanding signals going back up to space, um, you can listen in on uh, on many birds. And there's a project that we're going to highlight many, many times throughout this talk called uh, Satnogs. Uh, it's a team of folks all around the world that have come together to uh, you know, encourage people to build low-cost ground stations like a Raspberry Pi and a VHF antenna and a SDR. Uh, and you can start helping to instrument space through this project because all of these signals are in the clear uh, for, for the satellites that they deal with. Uh, there are uh, many more that have yet to be explored. Uh, it's a fun project once you've got your ground station going to go start sniffing waveforms and doing some reverse engineering, see what you can find. Uh, so. This next section, uh, I did apologize for in advance that uh, you know, it is a little, um, I think hyperbole is wrong. Everything is fairly down to earth as an attack for me, but um, oh, that was bad. Yeah. Um, but we should be afraid of these links. Uh, you, know, you made a really good point the other day that when Wi Fi came along, uh, you know, we heard from a lot of enterprises, they're like, oh, we're never going to go to that because we can't secure the RF flying in and out of the building. Um, and now many of the places that we work with today have BYOD policies and office Wi-Fi, uh, all in various states of security. Uh, and, you know, the concept of trustless is like just catching up to that, that, you know, just because somebody can get on your RF doesn't mean we should trust them. Um, I'm not seeing that there yet in, in the space segment. So, uh, one of the, the old and very public uh, stories, early attacks against uh, uh, satellite communications that are public, uh, satellite radio pirates. Uh, there have been so many different, I don't know what it is about Brazil, but so many different stories, different scenarios uh, from folks that are like rebroadcasting World Cup soccer to uh, people that are going and buying um, gear that, that the truckers would use, you know, you go to a truck stop and get your uh, UHF radio and do a simple conversion based on this, you know, anarchist cookbook board mod, um, you know, as, as early as the mid-90s to, to get yourself on a U.S. Navy UHF transponder um, and start talking to your buddies. Uh, and based on the way these transponders work, there's a vent pipe, RF goes up, RF comes down, that worked. There was no security in the flow to say, wait a minute, is this an authorized user of my transponder? Uh, or is this something I should degrade? Or, I don't know, send a team to investigate. Um, bits go up, bits go down. Uh, and even lower tech, I mentioned before about the uh, asking who had payment processors that they dealt with. Uh, if you Google people putting tinfoil on uh, dish feeds to rob gas stations, stories pop up all over the United States over the last 10 years. Like this keeps repeating itself, and it must work because folks keep doing it. Um, that you know, it takes a team of, of three or four folks that, that want to rob the place using stolen credit cards. Somebody climbs up on the roof, covers the feed on the dish back to Visa with a piece of tinfoil. Another one goes in and buys a whole bunch of liquor or buys a bunch of cigarettes, and then they're gone before the payment processor system catches up to say, hey, that was a stolen credit card. Uh, 
they also seem to get caught a lot because there's all this news reporting about it. Um, this is a super low tech attack. Like for all the people that talk to us and say, oh, space, you know, you need all this money to get involved and it's not going to get hacked because it takes all this crazy equipment. This was somebody attacking the space segment with something they could find in their kitchen. Uh, you know, piece, piece of tin foil. Uh, and, and it works. Um, so I asked the question at the beginning about, you know, do we have folks in the room with uh, VSAT terminals out there? Um, for the folks that do, you know, how many have, and you don't have to, to admit it, a rack like this out at a field site where you've got data coming off of a switch with all your, your protected special bits for your business just hooked up to the back of an iDirect or a Hughes modem or a Viasat modem, and you're trusting your satellite provider to keep all that safe as it shoots around through space, goes down to the teleport, gets moved from the teleport to some cloud entry point or some ISP entry point. Um, yeah, just a, a common sight to see that like trusted network, you know, no, no trustless firewall layer before the modem. So if you have a VSAT system, uh, there is a uh, uh, Yagi 2.4 gigahertz project that this guy has, has uh, put up on his website that I cited there. Uh, this particular Yagi project has some awesome resonances in the frequency bands that a lot of your, your uh, ComSat downlinks are going to come in in. Uh, you shove some broadband noise behind this Yagi that is you know, nothing special. It's designed for 2.4. You can use it for other things after you build it. Um, and you can start just shooting energy at a feed that you can see from a distance, and you're going to degrade that link. So this is, you know, your next step getting away from putting tinfoil over the feed to block it. Why don't we just dazzle it with RF, overload the feed, can't get in touch with the payment processor, and do it from a few blocks away. Um, unless you are instrumenting your file layer as a defender or as a blue teamer, uh, it, probably take you a while to figure out that that was what was going on or that there was some kind of you know, RF emission that was interfering with your, your receive flow. Um, going back to a picture of another teleport, this is in a completely different part of the world. Um, similar problem looking around for, for fences of any kind. Um, I understand there's like trees, but I've seen a lot of hikers around, good old schmoo theme last year, right? That, um, just backpack your way in and uh, get access to all kinds of cool RF. Um, maybe not get caught. Who knows? Um, so the, the last folks I'm going to pick on while I'm inspiring fear, uh, when we were preparing for this talk, I did a bunch of research on, on a number of places that uh, uh, academic programs that were launching CubeSat projects, which is fantastic. The cost of access to space has gotten so low or, you know, so manageable um, that, you know, we're seeing more and more student products, projects, grassroots projects. Um, these folks from U of I uh, decided to also set up their own ground station. So they were doing the command and control for their CubeSat uh, over a, you know, special waveform that they wrote or, you know, came up with their own, own system to do this. Um, so I started asking as I found these groups, you know, just sent an email saying, hey, in your system engineering process, do you guys talk about the security of that signal at all, or the authentication of your command signal? Because um, in a few years, just more and more people are, are building this access and understanding how um, really simple it is for them to start talking to space. Uh, we're going to start having the problem of, of someone took over my satellite, right? That somebody started commanding it to do things that I didn't want it to do. Um, because when we started this project five years ago, we weren't considering that security step in our engineering. Um, so no, no fault against that. I think it's something people haven't had to really think about before when they're dealing with their, their space segment. Uh, there are um, operators out there that will do you know, turnkey CubeSat for you that you know, if you want to launch a payload into space, you can partner with a company that's going to operate it. Um, if you do that, I also wouldn't assume that they're going to secure all of their links. So good questions to ask working with your partner or your vendor uh, is, uh, you know, what are you doing to, to protect my bits, protect my commands, protect my payload on orbit, uh, make sure that, you know, only we are allowed to, to drive it. Um, and 
I don't know if you want to offer up any personal experience on that process, but uh, another colleague here recently through an academic program uh, went through this is a, like a multi-year system engineering exercise, right? Yeah. Uh, to, you know, different parts of the university, different schools, all getting together to do this awesome project because it takes a village, space is hard, um, to get something up there and get a, a payload working. Um, and was, was security a topic ever? <laughs> Authentication, <laughs> dealing with the payload. Um, and, you know, at some point it's, it's too late, right? Like, you, you get far enough along and things are committed, you've gone through your CDR and it's all getting integrated and shipped off. You're like, oh, shoot. Nobody figures out what those commands were. Um, so I've talked about all these scary attacks, um, talked about all these things you should go out and investigate. Um, where to start picking up gear uh, or, or picking up things to practice. You can spend a lot of money really fast on things that are going to be super complicated and not that helpful if you're starting from, you know, a, a scratch background on RF or on dealing with space. So I'm going to try to run through some just like basic, you know, I, I can't speak for uh, uh, or warranty or guarantee all these products, but I have used everything that's listed here and, and most of it has been very user friendly. Um, the first step before you go out buying anything uh, is to ID what, what you're going to try to go after. Um, the, the whole space segment is an easy uh, ocean to start trying to boil, um, where there's all kinds of different RFs going on. There's, you know, do I want to look for LEOs that I need to build a, a system to point at as they fly by in the sky, or am I going to go after a geo satellite where maybe I just need, um, you know, to set up a dish with a feed so I can get my signal 36,000 kilometers out. Um, so, on this page, and again, you can go back to the slides, there's some uh, references to help you, um, you know, look at a list of what satellites are on orbit, what frequencies are they on, um, figure out where they fly. Uh, and then there's a, a project out there called Skyfield that once you have your, your um, TLE, your two-line element that says where that satellite is, it's just a state vector, basically, uh, you, know, you can punch that into this Python library and ask it, hey, I'm right here, here's my TLE, where do I have to point? And it'll spit back, you know, this is the, the elevation you should point out at the sky and the, the direction. Um, or if you have infinite money, uh, there's a company out there called AGI that uh, would love to sell you uh, STK, their uh, systems toolkit, um, that can do some awesome, like, RF modeling, all the math built in. Uh, there's a student version, you can get the demo, you can get the demo every month. Um, just keep making email addresses. Uh, didn't hear it here. All right. So once you pick something, if you're in the uh, like the VHF through C-band space, anything under six gigs, um, with an antenna, an LNA, and a radio, um, you can pick up all kinds of high power signals coming down from space. Uh, use GNU radio to to bust into them. There's projects out there to help you get started with that. You don't have to learn everything about GNU radio to get going. Um, I, I pick on uh, Ken's antennas here. These log periodics, uh, he does an awesome job with. Uh, Edis resells them. Um, I think that just says a lot about uh, getting that university money. The quality must be all right. Um, the uh, LANA LNA or the LNA for all, both, both great turnkey uh, low noise amplifiers to put behind that antenna. Uh, you can actually do a lot of signal work with an RTL SDR uh, for some of the, the lower frequency stuff. The, the bandwidths aren't super wide. Um, I, I encourage you to try that before you know, investing a lot of money into something uh, more intense radio wise. Uh, the HackRF, uh, also very popular in the InfoSec community, uh, opens you up to that six gig range. Um, but you hit some of that thing, uh, some of those links coming down to C-band. Um, the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, can handle a lot of this off the RTL. You're, you're probably going to need to run uh, off, off your laptop with the HackRF for some of these signals, but I encourage you to give it a shot. Uh, there's a tutorial link at the bottom that I think is solid work. I wasn't going to reinvent this one um, on how to do the RTL with Raspberry Pi at, and an antenna. Um, 
to uh, get hooked up with Satnox and start demodding some signals and, and uh, uh, sharing those with the community. Uh, when you want to go up above C band, uh, your HackRF is going to top out at about six gigahertz. Uh, a lot of these ComSat signals uh, that you might want to start instrumenting at your sites um, are going to come down at the K band, uh, KU, KA. Uh, that is going to be anywhere from you know, 18 to 30 gigahertz. Uh, so all of these ComSats are backed by some infrastructure, some VSAT provider uh, that wants to sell ground terminals, wants to have users. There are users out there. So they make purpose-built hardware for all of them. And this goes back to that whole pick your target thing. Um, that instead of trying to find some way to say, OK, I want to be able to go after every signal between 18 and 30 gigahertz, a lot of dollar signs behind that question right now. Uh, if you want to go after one Viasat signal that looks exactly like the one you're getting at your uh, remote site or uh, you know, your, your oil rig or your boat, whatever, uh, go to eBay and punch in Viasat. Uh, you know, what do we have? We have bucks here for transmit, LNB for receive. Um, start looking for these uh, feeds because people will sell the kit that they have left over from their old Viasat deployment to try to recoup some IT costs. I, I'm not sure why they're doing it. I'm not also sure why Viasat's not out trying to round those things up. Um, but generally, if you keep an eye on what you're looking for, um, you know, I've been able to find the hardware I needed for any provider just going that direction instead of trying to invent a, a general purpose system. Um, what these things do, at least for the feeds, is they're going to take that high frequency signal and translate it down uh, to usually an L band signal, so something between like 900 and uh, uh, 1700 megahertz, uh, which is in a perfect spot to hook up your RTL and see, hey, do I just see energy going up and down here? A lot of the waveforms are wider than what the RTL can handle. Um, HackRF may be able to, to get you there. Um, but uh, you know, that's a, a quick way to get up and running just trying to instrument um, what's, what's going on around you. So the software uh, for this whole SDR thing, uh, I didn't do this on purpose, but I'm rocking the, the GNU Radio Con shirt from a couple years ago. Um, the, the whole GNU Radio platform is, uh, has all the tools you need to get started. Uh, I, my, my hot take on popular opinion popular opinion, depending on what room I'm in, uh, simultaneously the most approachable and unapproachable piece of open source software out there. Um, it is really easy to make GNU Radio flow graphs that are really hard, um, especially if you don't have a background in DSP. Uh, there are some fantastic projects to help simplify this for you if you're interested in going after space. Uh, the GR Satellites program uh, is... Uh, so Daniel Estevez uh, that, that runs that. Uh, he has actually briefed that this morning at FOSTEM. So I updated the slides and, and slipped in the tweet there uh, to go check out what's going on with that project. But he is building GNU radio blocks for all the different components in uh, these open telemetry and uh, uh, payload signals from the satellites that Satnogs works with and, and many others. But So once you pick your target, or maybe you pick your target from that list, um, you know, there's, uh, there's blocks there so that you don't have to figure out how to do all of the DSP and all of the bit processing. You just want to look at the data and say, hey, you know, what kind of messages are they sending down to uh, so that, that project will help get you started. Uh, I, I left a note here for folks to go back and look at these slides later. Um, GNU Radio recently released version 3.8. Uh, it's been a long time coming, a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, there's a lot of old code. Uh, or old projects you'll find tutorials for, and when I say old, they're like from the middle of the year last year that have not been updated to 3.8 and are not compatible one way or the other. So just pay attention to what your package manager is delivering. Um, I encourage everybody to just build all of it up from source, and then it works very nicely uh, in the environment that you've put together. But um, one other project, I'm going to take a minute and let let you talk about, but is the, the GNU radio out of trees for Iridium. 
Yeah, so really the only reason we bring up Iridium, we're not picking on Iridium, um, it's really because we, we want to talk about the paradigm shift that uh, uh, Yakko just talked about uh, earlier, which is that more and more companies are starting to use these constellations as part of their enterprise. And uh, we saw the evolution of uh, wi wireless and IoT start to bring those types of questions into your pen tests and like how do we go about um, testing these things and making sure they're not um, compromising the uh, enterprise. So th the reason we talk about Iridium in this case is because there's stuff all over the internet about it. If you're using it, um, you can't really rely on the constellation itself to secure your data. Um, it's funny, there was a talk about this a couple of year, a few years ago now, um, and they, uh, the Iridium guys used to have on their website, it used to talk about, you know, what is the security of Iridium? And they, said, and they basically said, they're like, you know, this is way too complicated for people to approach as a hacker. Um, you have these Leos, they're traveling at 17,000 miles per hour, the Doppler's gonna be way too big, nobody can figure out how to demodulate this stuff. Um, but the open source community obviously has done that. Um, so um, what you can do, if you, if you Google GR Iridium, which is a GNU uh, radio project, open source, um, you can download that and start playing around with it yourself. Um, in terms of um, antennas and that kind of thing, uh, you can go on Amazon, you can buy, I think like $15, you can buy a um, Iridium patch panel just stick it out your window and uh, you'll start to see these bursts. Um, there's, a, uh, there's another project called uh, Iridium Toolkit, which does some of the uh, DMOD on that. Um, not all of the frame types have been reverse engineered, but you, you can start to get some, um, mess, uh, essentially kind of like pager messages. Uh, you can get also voice, uh, voice streams out of this. Um, one of the things that we mentioned earlier was that these Leos, and the way the Iridium constellation works is a little bit different than some other um, SATCOM technologies you might be using where um, when you make a call via Iridium, um, the specific transponder downlink needs to be specified um, as part of that call. So you're not receiving, um, if you start to sniff that uh, downlink, you're not gonna be receiving um, all of Iridium's uh, traffic. You're receiving anything that's destined for that transponder, um, which in this area you'll probably find is not that interesting. Um, I also don't recommend necessarily doing this because it sort of gets to a gray line of uh, whether or not uh, people find that uh, legal or not. Um, it could be argued because you're not decrypting anything that, uh, and you're just, you have an antenna that's receiving energy, like I can't stop the energy from going into my antenna, I'm not decrypting anything. But um, there are people that will argue that it's uh, maybe it's sort of a gray area. So only do this if you want, but um, I'm just warning you guys for that. Um, but yeah, you will be able to pull out voice streams. Um, you're gonna probably get truckers or something. Um, Central in Central Virginia, really. Um, some of the other talks about this have been kind of cool is because if you're in Europe or even Eastern Europe area, um, you start to get downlinks in the Afghanistan region, um, which you'll find way more interesting stuff. Uh, governments all over the world are still using Iridium and uh, they're not asking these questions about whether or not their comms are secure on this platform, so. Um, I don't know, just something uh, very approachable. There's an open source community for it, and it's an easy way to get into this type of um, activity. Um, but I'm not really advocating you do this to spy on people. I'm really advocating, I'm, I'm advocating this is because it shows you how um, weak some of this stuff is. Um, and the, the paradigm shift that we were seeing from wireless to IoT to now SATCOM um, the, you have uh, AWS Ground Station now that's coming out. You have all sorts of companies that are providing these services and you really need to start asking those questions. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else. Hand it back to you. Sure. Yeah. 
you, you make a, a point I want to hit on again in there that um, that that tool is open source and some of those waveforms haven't been rolled in yet and I would love to sit and watch a project uh, or watch a talk in the next couple of years on hey I picked this up I figured out what was going on I learned how to use GNU radio and I've added one of these waveforms into this project uh, it's for somebody out there to do next year um, so what can you do to get started, especially if you're going back to your enterprise and you want to start you know, rolling this into your blue team activities, your red team activities, your just general IT uh, instrumentation activity? Um, instrument or, or your uh, L-band link on your, your VSAT systems if you've got them. Uh, you can go on eBay, buy yourself a L-band switch that's going to be the right, or L-band splitter, the right impedance, and not degrade your signal so much that um, you know you, you upset the uh, BISAC guys with your, your link quality going down. Um, you can do a, a dumb easy GNU radio flow graph to take an FFT off of that um, with your, your HackRF and uh, pipe that FFT out to a Python block to post the float values up to your Elastic instance or your Splunk instance or whatever. Uh, that data, then you can just look at that every day and say, hey, has this changed? Has my signal to noise ratio moved around? Has my noise floor moved around? Um, you know, might be the first indicator that something's going on with uh, one of your, your fielded access points. Um, you could maybe detect that tinfoil covering up the, uh, the, the feed uh, or some directed energy coming from elsewhere. Uh, you may also detect a snowstorm or clouds uh, <laughs> or, you know, orbital eclipse or all kinds of things, but you'll at least, uh, you know, have some data to inform you that, hey, something is a little different about our link today. Um, I use this technique on a couple of other antennas. It doesn't just apply to space, but if you've got an antenna that receives data, um, you know, throw a, a splitter in the, the path there if you can afford it in your link budget. Um, and just, just look at that file layer just a little bit. Um, give you a sense of, of what's going on in your environment. Um, the other thing you can do to learn a lot uh, from a community that is super active in, you know, pick your comms medium. Um, you know, if you're, you're up on Twitter, there's a lot of folks talking uh, all the time about their Satnogs stations. Um, this is the, the one I was bringing up earlier where you take your Raspberry Pi and your RTL and your existing ham antennas, uh, as long as you can, you know, properly impedance match your equipment, um, you know, start contributing data back to them and, um, and, and learning from that project. Um, great, great set of resources there and, and rock solid community. Uh, the road's getting longer. Uh, the, the ramp up. Uh, in, in skills that are going to be required to go from just like basic, or I shouldn't say basic, but uh, the, the ham level of RF interaction to what the SATCOM industry is starting to do. Um, more and more things are starting to get bolted in along the way. You know, uh, Blacko pointed out that uh, Iridium does some, some routing in space, right? Your message goes up and then it goes down where the, the receiver or intended receiver is. Uh, more and more of the, uh, the big ComSat providers uh, are going to a what's called a high throughput satellite model. Uh, you can find all kinds of great like Gartner data if you go out and, and Google that on, on how that industry is doing. Not a lot about what they're doing for security. Uh, but these involve satellite crosslinks. So instead of doing bent pipes, the satellites are actually doing some inspection on the signal to decide where should it go. Uh, is this authorized? I don't know. Um, and then routing it around the world, which means even more dynamic paths uh, for you know, potential disruption, vulnerability introduction. Um, now you've got software that's doing signal processing, in the case of the ones that are doing inspection on the satellite, up in space. Um, so I'm ready for, for like a talk on a space zero day. Um, that, would be, that would be fun and probably get somebody arrested. Uh, one of the other projects that, that uh, Wacko had mentioned there, the AWS Ground Station. Uh, this is an Amazon's model to do everything as a service. Um, Amazon will now, uh, they're putting um, SATCOM receivers on many of their facilities. They will also lease your antenna if you've got one to provide access to somebody else. So going back to that 
I want to launch a CubeSat model. What services can I go out and find? Amazon says, hey, you can buy downlink by the drink uh, instead of having to go stand up infrastructure. Uh, this introduces yet another vulnerability in this process where now we're going to take our SATCOM problem and we're going to make it a cloud problem um, and see how many other buzzwords we can, we can shove in here. Yeah, so that's all that we've, we've prepared for you guys to kind of set the stage. Uh, I think we've got five minutes left, uh, but I can take some questions. Any questions? Somebody's got to have a question. What you got? What do you think about Starlink? What do I think about Starlink? I think Starlink is going to do exactly what, what we're talking about as far as kind of pushing the state of the art and, and pushing the, um, the uh, number of people who are engaged with space. That, you know, Elon Musk is the type that he wants to get his product out there, get his brand out there, get his name out there. Once Starlink is going, there's going to be Starlink stuff all over the place. And, you know, those links might be secure, they might not be secure, uh, but there's definitely going to be more and more traffic going up and down into space. Um, they are also not the only constellation that plans on having like 11 bajillion uh, disposable satellites in LEO. Uh, there's some, some cool models you can find online of like what space is going to look like by 2030 that's just based on ITU filings. Um, and it's like a beehive where you can't see the planet Earth anymore because there's so many of these you know, cheap disposable uh, commsats going up. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what I think about Starlink. Did you, sir, did you have one? Or, yeah. So every satellite that gets launched has to have a plan for how it's going to deorbit? Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the, the question was, um, you know, holy grail for a, a hacker uh, to, is to go after, you know, taking over and, and possibly destroying or, or adjusting the orbit or deorbiting um, a satellite. Uh, and I'm going to add a little flavor on there. Uh, getting ransomware on your satellite seems like the <laughs> the model, right, for every other exploit out there is how do we own somebody's system and get money out of them. Um, you know, do both Leos and Geos have these uh, these capabilities on board? Uh, so every my answer every satellite that goes up has to have a plan for what it's going to do when it dies, when it's going to die, um, and usually that involves deorbiting for Leo. Um, for the Geos, they actually push them out farther. We push our our trash out into a orbit that we can deal with later. Um, that really, it's the, it's the the graveyard orbit. It's like an extra you know what, 100 kilometers out or something from, from the rest of them. Um, if that command and control signal, right, is not authenticated, unencrypted, um, then, you know, that is a, a vulnerability that somebody could go after. Uh, I'll say it here and I'd love to have, you know, somebody give me the talk that corrects me. Uh, yeah, challenge it out to the community. Any other questions around the room? Or we'll get off the stage and let the other guys get ready here. Cool. Thanks, guys.